With so many cases of child sexual assault, one day you could find your Child sexual assault is a horrific crime that often leaves its victims scarred well into their adult life. And although public awareness campaigns don't appear to be stopping the crimes occurring, people do seem to be reporting them to police in increasing numbers. Last year, 64 young boys and girls were reported as having been sexually assaulted in the region, while this year more than 200 have already been reported. The trend uh, has been that there's been more reports of uh, sexual assaults on children in the last three years, uh, I think, uh, ever before. Offenders are usually not strangers. They are mostly a person that the child knows and trusts, such as a friend, relative or their stepfather. Would you say there's actually been an increase in the number of crimes, or would you say that it's just the increase in reporting of those crimes? I believe it's an increase in the reporting only because uh, some of the people you talk to, the, the parents have been uh, victims of uh, child sexual abuse themselves. Alligator weed is a native of South America. It was probably dumped on the shores of Stockton Beach along with ballast from visiting coal ships back in the 1920s. Free of natural predators and perfectly suited to the climate, the weed thrived on coastal farms but went almost unnoticed for decades. With recent outbreaks further inland, the weed has suddenly gained prominence. Federal Resources Minister Peter Morris announced a research grant to the CSIRO of more than $100,000 to control the weed after inspecting test control plots here at Williamtown. What the researchers have found is that the weed is almost indestructible. Deep root systems have allowed it to survive heavy chemical bombardment and the introduction of parasitic insects hasn't had great success. Out of control it could choke recreational waterways and kill native fish, but the worst imaginable disaster is if the weed gets into Australia's multi-million dollar irrigation crops. We're worried that it will get into uh, the irrigation systems in inland Australia. I'm from the Centre for Irrigation and Freshwater Research, CSRO, and if it got into, say, the rice there, there might not be a rice industry in future. The prospect of scanning the employment pages after working for years in the one industry filled retrenched miners with despair. Although entitled to unemployment benefits, many had financial commitments geared to a higher income. In the battle to find work, the CES and Glendale TAFE offered one option, practical skills in small business management. A course which usually takes a year part-time was condensed to six weeks. Fourteen men today completed the intense period of study. They were taught record keeping, stock control, staff management, finance, merchandising and computer skills. Going back to the books also boosted their self-esteem and generated a more positive attitude. 46-year-old Terry Fain was retrenched from Walls End Borehole Colliery after working for 19 years in the mining industry. The particular course that I'm doing, uh, I think that anybody that, that doesn't do it are very foolish because you learn so much from it. Not just on business management, you learn about communication, presentation, all these things uh, are skills that you know, a lot of people never ever achieve. Terry is now looking forward to opening a tennis centre. Four of the men have work lined up. All say they are confidently optimistic about the future. Late this afternoon, hundreds of workers were swarming over the building site with only hours to go before the official opening. Even as the minutes ticked away, manager of WDC Holdings, Peter Masters, was confident that the workers would meet the target. Oh, it just always seems to develop that way. It's been a uh, really busy day. We are hoping to have it finished yesterday or the day before, but uh, so many of the uh, actual bits and pieces to finish off, it's just got down to this afternoon. But luckily, uh, we're there. Right, so for the people that are coming tonight, they're going to see the full work. Something's going to be closed, really? Yeah. No, it'll all be open tonight. It's going to be a big show. As it turned out, the official decision to go ahead with the opening couldn't have been cut any finer. 
At about 4 o'clock, management announced that a last-minute safety problem with lighting could not be corrected in time and preparations were made to refund over 1,000 tickets. Then, an hour later, the green light once again. Relieved management announced that the problem had been overcome and the opening was going ahead as scheduled. Despite the rush, Peter Masters says nothing will be missing from the big night. For most Australians, the annual summer tan is a labour of love. Soaking up the sun for hours on end is easy work, but sometimes the reward can be devastating. This year, the campaign against melanoma is a fierce battle on the beaches. Over the weekend, stations at Bar Beach and Redhead are spreading the word on the cancer caused by harmful ultraviolet rays. So just how many sun seekers are in the high risk group? Well, people uh, that uh, tan very poorly, people that sunburn, and uh, people that have a large number of mel uh, melanoma or moles, uh, and people that uh, have uh, a lot of freckles. Uh, there are certain types of uh, moles which we do recognise as being of high risk, and uh, we can identify these things and tell people what precautions they should take. The checkups, which will continue tomorrow by trained medical staff at the battle stations, are free. Facts and advice on the disease, which kills thousands of Australians every year, are also on hand. According to Dr Bob Silla, today's screening found definite cases of melanoma in its early stage. We don't uh, wish to frighten people, but uh, we do uh, believe that people should be very, very conscious of the, of the dangers of uh, solar damage to their skin. Uh, and particularly the, uh, the likelihood of developing melanoma, which of course uh, can be quite fatal. Led by the 2nd Battalion Brass Band, the regimental soldiers marched through the city, exercising their right to the freedom of entry that was granted nearly 20 years ago. Led by Commanding Officer Lieutenant Colonel Bell, they were armed with... Swords drawn, bayonets fixed, drums beating, bands playing and colours flying. The unit was challenged by Chief Inspector Ian Cleary, who then granted permission. The soldiers were then inspected by the official party, which included Lord Mayor John McNaughton and parade host Brigadier Carey. The 2nd Battalion's ties with Newcastle date back to World War I. With the recent reorganisation of the Army Reserve, the northern half of the unit, based at Port Macquarie and Taree, will join the 41st Battalion, while the rest of the unit, based in the Hunter, will link up with Sydney's 17th Battalion. Although Newcastle will lose its only infantry unit, it will remain at company strength. It's losing a battalion but creating a new one by linking with the 17th. There will still be Army Reserve Infantry soldiers in Newcastle and that will be known as C Company, the City of Newcastle Company, within the 2nd 17th Battalion. As the 2nd Battalion dismissed for the last time, the historic colours, the symbol of the regiment, were folded. They bear the battle honours granted in recognition of gallant deeds performed by its members. For three and a half decades, the Mardi Gras has been an annual get-together for the small shire of Wyong on the central coast. Every year the event grows, including the parade, which today featured the entrance of the Mardi Gras Queen Contest. This year, organisers received a record number of contestants, and today, 30 hopeful beauties wave to onlookers as the colourful floats pass by. Local sporting groups, businesses, theatre groups and emergency service crews joined in the fun to help make the Mardi Gras procession the longest ever seen. With more than 80 floats, there were a few familiar faces. 
The festivities continue tonight and tomorrow with concerts and a huge fair in Memorial Park. The highlight will be the crowning of the Mardi Gras Festival Queen tomorrow afternoon. Les Light won a major share of the $6,000 in prize money for his effort. The Blue Ribbon event for the Grand National Division is raced over 40 laps and the Lismore Charger showed a real mastery of the circuit. In second place was Northern Territory driver Paul Brown, while local driver Graham Lilford finished third. In the preliminaries leading up to the Coke Masters, Queensland driver Peter Morris had a lucky escape from serious injury in this spectacular crash. Oh, here's a car in trouble! right up on the wall. The event was won by Alan Butcher from Queensland with Ralph Ranger in second spot and Singleton's John Smith placed third. Thanks to a long-term relationship between Australia and Korea, there are now well over 40 families in the Newcastle area alone who've adopted Korean orphans. Each year they get together to share the joys and problems of raising their children, and right now their main concern is the increasing bureaucratic delays in gaining approval for bringing the orphans into Australia. Andrew and Ruth Taylor have already adopted one child, Lee, and they're prepared to go through the same exhaustive screening process conducted by the Department of Youth and Community Services to adopt a second, but they object to extra delays and anxieties caused by what they believe are inadequate staffing levels to cope with the selection process. It's a situation where there's not a lot of staff to handle the papers and uh, therefore us people on the end of the, the whole business are often waiting because of lack of staff and uh, this creates, un well, really undue hold-ups and yeah, lengthy delays. Right, now, ap apart from uh, this here in Australia, what effect does it have on the kids themselves who are waiting to be adopted? Well, pleased to say there that they are in good, uh, generally good foster care, and, uh, but I think it's a case of humane circumstances. We, uh, uh, the impending parents, like to get to the, have the children as soon as possible and as early as possible. The Taylors will take their complaint to member for Charlestown Richard Face, but they and other adoptive parents hope the government will respond to group pressure by looking towards future streamlining of the adoption procedure for other couples hoping to adopt Korean children. The King Street Fair is now an established Christmas tradition in Newcastle and organisers claim that in some years up to 30,000 people have flocked to the event. The crowds were there again this year, milling through about 150 street stalls or cooling off in the shade while any one of three bands kept them entertained. With the opening procession out of the way, the crowds had a chance to hunt for those special Christmas knickknacks without panic and they had plenty to choose from including a range of pottery and handcraft as well as traditional cakes and jams. But the event isn't just just for fun, a giant Christmas hamper will also be raffled to raise money for Christmas presents for underprivileged children. The street fair wasn't the only attraction in Newcastle today. Just down the road, the Royal New Zealand Navy's anti-submarine frigate Wellington lowered its gangplank for a public inspection. It's the first time the warship has visited Newcastle, and by all accounts, the 250 crew were impressed with the hospitality of the Novocastrians over the past three days. The ship will sail out tomorrow for more trials after an extensive refit, but before leaving port, they gave the locals a chance for a close-up inspection of one of the principal vessels in New Zealand's maritime defence. There is to be no change in the management of the company and the management team led by Managing Director Joe Sweeney is expected to take a more substantial equity in NBN. Fulcrum Limited, a specialist in management buyout schemes, is an associate company of the major merchant bank Security Pacific. 
Two senior executives, Mr Ted O'Halloran, the chairman of Security Pacific, and Mr Fred Kempson, the managing director of Security Pacific, will join the board of NBN, where Mr John Peshaw continues as chairman. The other local directors are Mr Peter Cleaves and Mr Joe Sweeney. Good afternoon, I'm Belinda Borisso. Hunter Technology is today celebrating the official opening of its half a million dollar annex. The annex is designed to support technology based ventures and help overcome unemployment. We'll bring you a full report on that tonight. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. Forty young hopefuls from throughout the Hunter region are tonight facing the judges in the grand final of Model for Life 1987. We'll bring you a full report on that tonight. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. Around 150 university, industry and local government representatives attended the opening of the Hunter Technology Annex based in the grounds of the Newcastle University. Industrial Development and Decentralisation Department Director David Eason opened the building. The annex is the first stage of development for the Hunter Technology Development Centre and is occupied by several companies developing under Newcastle University's commercial company Tunra. That company will be able to grow, have a base and pull on, if necessary, the expertise and professional people working within uh, Hunter Technology to assist their growth and we're very much hoping that they will grow to become $10 million, $50 million company in the future. The second stage of the centre, a $3.5 million building at the front of the university, should be finished by March. The centre is being established from funds provided by the Commonwealth and state governments. The Commonwealth has provided $5 million, while the state is budgeting for recurring funds of $300,000 a year. The Australian Institute of Physics will move from Sydney to the centre, which will house several other businesses and provide enterprise development areas, conference facilities and business support services. We are looking for companies that will grow, and very often a company will start off, as we have one at the moment, with a $350,000 investment. That company is beginning to uh, put its act together and we're now looking for a two to three million dollar investment uh, in that company. Now that is a company that will probably locate in the centre and be located here in the Hunter region. We have worked with other companies that were in fact basically bankrupt and we've managed to uh, help them get funds of between nine and ten million dollars. Meanwhile Hunter Technology is looking at ways of creating up to 30,000 jobs in the Hunter by the year 2000. In business terms it claims that will require the establishment of at least 10 billion dollars worth of new businesses. Melanie was found wandering in scrub about 20 kilometres from a Kersley home yesterday morning. This tearful reunion with mother Denise Tisdall was the best possible outcome of a 24-hour search involving hundreds of police, SES volunteers and local residents. But the disappearance raised worrying questions for police who continued their inquiries today. Late this afternoon, four people were arrested by Cessnock detectives and charged with offences relating to the alleged abduction of two-and-a-half-year-old Melanie. A 27-year-old man has already appeared in Cessnock court on charges of giving misleading statements and causing a public mischief. A man and a woman both aged 28 and another man in his late 40s, all from Kersley, have been bailed to appear at Cessnock Court on December the 14th.
Each year, for the past three, winemakers have been able to submit their wares to a selection panel headed by the Deputy Director General of the Department of Agriculture, Graham Gregory. Also on the panel is noted wine judge, John Beeston, and a group of senior hunter winemakers. With their nod as to 100% hunter origin, and true to variety and vintage, and being good enough, of course, the wines receive this seal of endorsement from the state government. 91 wines were submitted this year, but only 14 were allowed benchmark status and 10 classic status, and a maximum of four for any maker. The classics are judged mature and up to scratch. Benchmark wines are assessed by the panel as good, but with development potential. National sales manager for Hungerford Hill, Joseph Antosh, says it's not possible to cheat. The auditing is wine juice tight. We engage John Beeston uh, as our consultant, and uh, John, uh, once wines are selected and are accredited with the benchmark or the classic uh, sticker, John then goes and draws samples direct from each winery. Uh, if the wine at that stage has not been bottled, he actually goes to the tank and gets samples. Wine buffs can always tell a good one, but this scheme is designed to reassure those starting out and overseas visitors who aren't familiar with our ways. Selectors say today's trials are a little hectic thanks to bad conditions off the beach in the past few weeks forcing cancellation of two surf carnivals. Nevertheless, the majority of the squad are more or less certainties today's trials will simply confirm their places and give promising contestants a shot at a place. For the first time, the Newcastle squad will include three women. That's a controversial ruling by the host club, North Narrabeen. The women will compete directly against the men and Newcastle's strong women swimmers should hold their own. But it's champions like 14-year-old Peter Watts, recognised as a strong AIS candidate, and Guy Andrews, absent today for Ironman events, who will make the difference. Newcastle's juniors have an excellent record, and coach Greg Kelly says they're in with a good chance to win. The disappearance of Melanie Tisdall from her uncle's home in Kersley sparked a massive search as fears increased for the girl's safety. Hundreds of police, SES volunteers and neighbours searched on foot in four-wheel drive and from the air for traces of the missing infant. Searchers were forced to call off the hunt overnight, but later the next day a breakthrough. The girl was found alive and well in scrub about 20 kilometres from her home. The discovery heightened police anxiety to find out just what had happened over the past day and night. Then, following inquiries on Wednesday, a number of arrests were made. Among them, 27-year-old Ronald Thomas Tisdall on charges of making a false statement and causing a public mischief in relation to the alleged abduction of a child. Then, later, three more people appeared in Cessnock local court, a man and a woman, both 28, and another man, 47, all of Kersley. They've been bailed to reappear at Cessnock local court on December the 14th to answer several charges relating to the alleged abduction. Hi, I'm David Mackay. Raymond Terrace is the host of Australia's biggest ever ski tournament. To be called Ski 88, the Pro Jump Classic will be held during March. For all the news, join us tonight at 6. In NBN News tonight, we look at the highlights of last night's final of the Model for Life quest. The quest was won by a Meriwether hairdresser out of 40 finalists. Money raised will go to Hunter Life Education. For all the news, join us tonight at 6.